I'm thinking I'm the one that's going to start this. How are you doing? It's good to see you. I have a whole new thing to talk about. Um, I'm excited. So what I thought we would do is have, I know your sits are normally 40 to 45, they said, but I thought I'd do 30 minutes, do a little bit of guidance here in the beginning. And um, uh, then have a little talk and, and then uh, uh, some questions, take some time for questions. So maybe 30, 30, 30. That's what I usually like to do in an hour and a half uh, time space. I probably should introduce myself. Some of you may know I'm Tuere Salah. I'm a guiding teacher at Seattle Insight. And um, uh, yeah, so I've been teaching for, I guess, about uh, oh, 10 years. And I've been practicing about 30. So I think I have more practice experience than I have teaching experience. That's a good thing. <laughs> so. I thought tonight, given the state of the world we live in, a good thing to talk about would be anger. And I want to talk, I am such a mudita person, but that mudita, I'm full of joy. And that joy I have access to, I think, because I finally reconciled with anger. And so I believe that talking about anger is a good way to help increase our joy. So we'll talk a little bit about it. That's the plan. Does that sound okay? It sounds okay to me too. So let's start with a step. I want to start with a poem. Give you something to contemplate. Something to consider. So if your mind starts wandering off into thinking, See if you could just adjust it to feeling into what this poem brings up. It's not really even a poem. It's just a quote from uh, David White, a poet. Um, this is what David says. Anger is the deepest form of compassion for another, for the world, for the self, for a life, for the body, for a family, and for all our ideals, all vulnerable and all possibly about to be hurt. Anger is the deepest form of compassion. Stripped of physical imprisonment and violent reaction, anger is the purest form of care. The internal living flame of anger always illuminates what we belong to, what we wish to protect, and what we are willing to hazard ourselves for. That's what I want you to consider, contemplate on that. And I'll kind of get us started. Settle us into the body a bit here. One way I like to start always, always uh, my sits coming into an arriving energy is by just noticing sounds. So you may not have any ambient sounds around you, but you could listen to just the sound of someone speaking. It's just the sound. Maybe notice when I go up in my voice and down in my voice, and whether or not there's space in between what I'm saying. Just notice it as sound. You can think of it as allowing the ears to just do what the ears have been doing all day, what they've been doing since you were alive. They just hear. They hear anything. They hear everything. And you're just 
letting go of the evaluation of that hearing and just tuning in to the awareness of, oh, the ears are hearing. Let's get a sense of that hearing. Sometimes when you let the ears hear, you also begin to notice the fullness of the body sitting or lying down. It's like when we stop talking about and we just connect to hearing, we can then begin to feel the fullness of body. Heaviness of body, the hardness of the bones in the body. It's just this body sitting here with ears that hear. Pretty interesting to feel this, to know this. I could notice how still the body is if you're not moving any of your limbs. That hearing, that hearing and that sound might be moving, but the body is still. Still body hard and solid and heavy, not moving. You might be aware of movement and sound. You might be aware of movement in the body breathing. You might be aware of movement in your mind's thoughts passing, coming and going. Maybe sensations are moving in the body. We're just sitting here getting interested in sound it's moving on its own, nothing to do with us, just hearing it, connected to a body that's just sitting still, nothing to do. Noticing the movement of breath, it's breathing. Maybe the noticing of thought, the noticing of changing sensations. You don't have to do anything. Just have to sit here and be aware of it, get interested in it. So if you notice yourself getting lost in thought about the past and the future and this and that, see if you could drop down into the felt sense of this heavy body hard bones. Notice that your hands are not moving, feet are not moving, legs, torso, that the body is still and the thoughts are moving. Notice 
Or if you get stuck in the weightedness of the body and you start falling into sleepiness, then maybe pay attention to the movement of sound, the movement of the body breathing, the movement of sensation. If you're really interested, see if you can notice the stillness of the body, the movement of sound and thoughts and sensation and breath. Same time. So interesting what you can be aware of. When you're not writing commentary about what's happening and just interested in the fact that you know what's happening. I'm going to mute myself now. We can sit in silence or sit in our own space. But see if you can stay here with the interest in this moment. Do you really have to think about that old story yet again? Do we need to analyze that again or rethink over those list of things to do? Or could you really give yourself the permission to just sit and enjoy not having to do anything, noticing the stillness and the peace of it, and noticing the movement consistency of it, the rhythm of it.
So consider this. Anger is the deepest form of compassion for another, for the world, for the self, for a life, for the body. Compassion for a family or for all our ideals, all vulnerables and all possibly about to be hurt. Stripped of physical imprisonment and violent reaction, anger is the purest form of care. The internal living flame of anger always illuminates what we belong to, what we wish to protect, and what we are willing to hazard ourselves for. That's a quote by David White. Thank you so much for inviting me. For those who weren't on the call at the very beginning, I was saying that I was going to give a talk on anger. And when I read this uh, quote some while ago, I think I never heard anyone talk about anger in this way. And maybe it's maybe it's because I'm a black woman, but anger is such a real part of my existence. And I think it's the real part of human existence that sometimes I I think the way we as practitioners talk about anger is not this anger, this quote anger. This quote anger is the anger I want to live with. I want to have. I want to have it around me. I want my people to have it. I want my friends. And I want to know that anyone I'm with are willing to access the power and that compassion of that anger in order to uh, be in the world, be protectors in the world, and look after the world. But I, I want to go back first and talk a little bit about the misunderstanding I had with anger. So I grew up in a house full of anger. So anger, 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 anger. My father was angry. And my mother was angry. Everybody was angry. All the kids was angry. We were just anger. My father was very aggressive outward with his anger. And my mother was very passive. You would never know that woman was angry. She was just too oozing with sweetness. And people would say, oh, your mother is so sweet. And I'm like, yeah, she's angry. And I'm not talking about anger like, uh, you know, oh my God, I had a miserable childhood and the abuse was just reeking. I didn't even know they were angry. I realized they were angry years later. But when I was growing up, I just was in them, around them. I just grew up with anger. So 
I'm hoping you get that I was pretty angry for a long time. I mean, that was just the go-to energy. Anybody want to get what you want, you got to be angry. And so I knew how to be angry. I knew how to intimidate when I needed to get my way. And I knew how to be passive when I needed to get my way and skilled at it. That's probably why I was a prosecutor you know, for so many years. But in 2000, so when I, one more step, when I entered the Dhamma, this is the place I started having problems because I entered a world that was so quiet, the loudness of my anger was driving me crazy, just way too much. I was too big, too loud, this is just, it just didn't fit. And so I tried for many years, I'd say the first half of my practice years, trying to be nice, to not be angry, that somehow I had the impression that anger was too loud and noisy in a, in a practice that's based in samadhi and quiet. Uh, equanimity. So I should be equiposed. You can't have anger and be equiposed. And then my nephew got shot. He was an innocent bystander and he got shot. And I lost the ability to manage that anger. I lost the ability to wield it and control it the way I wanted to. And what ended up happening was I grew more and more and more rageful and uh, rageful at my kids, rageful at people in my office, rageful at defense attorneys. I was just raging at anybody. It didn't really matter. And that raging began to scare me to the point where I thought, I'm gonna have to do something about this. So I went to my teacher at that time was Rodney Smith. And I asked him, what am I going to do with all this anger? I got to find some way to fix it. And he said, uh, don't worry about the anger, Tori. Work, work on your irritations. I'm like, and, and if I work on the irritations, is that going to fix the anger? He's like, don't worry about the anger. Work on your irritations. So I, I'm thinking... He's a white man. He don't really understand the level of anger I'm talking about. I might have to break it down a little bit because I'm talking on the level of going to lockup rage. That's the kind of anger I'm talking about. And so maybe he doesn't understand. I'm trying to support him in this helpful way. Maybe I need to translate. So I kept trying to come up with language that I thought he would really understand what I'm talking about. This anger is a problem that needs to be fixed and we need to fix it. And finally he said, Tuare, by the time you get angry, you've already left the box. You've left the gate. You're out of the yard. If you wanna work on your anger, you gotta work on your irritations. I said, I don't have any irritations. I go from zero to 90. So I need to work on the anger and maybe then I could see the irritations. He said, no, you got to look for the irritations and the anger will go away on its own. I just never heard that kind of a practice. And I left. You know, with the kind of thinking, he's my teacher. I'm going to do what he says. So I had great respect for Rodney. But I don't think he knows what he's talking about. I think he's missing something. Maybe he don't have anger like me. <laughs> yeah, maybe white people don't have anger like we do. But like folks, we can generate some anger. And so I'm thinking he must just not get it. But okay, we're going to try his thing. And the thing that I noticed was shocking. 
first of all, I was irritated at everything. I woke up irritated. I lived all day in irritation. I was irritated about everything. I would leave my house to go catch the bus to go to work. And inevitably, I knew what time the bus would pass my stop. But I would watch that bus pass the stop in front of me every single morning. And I would get so mad, I would spend the entire bus ride to work mad because the bus driver left me. I was mad at everything. I would get mad if I was had a pot on the stove stirring the sauce, the tomato sauce, and it would spill out onto the stove and I would get mad about that. I'm at, I, I was irritated at everything. And it took me quite a bit to learn to work with that irritation. And I understood what Rodney was pointing to. That's what I wanna talk about. I think there's a difference between the anger that David White is pointing to, real anger, necessary anger that we need as human beings, and the aversion that we get trapped in and get locked in when we ignore our irritations, when we ignore frustration. So this anger that David White is pointing to, that is a regular emotion. It's an emotion like all emotions. And as such, it's ephemeral. It rises and passes away. But it has enough, uh, it's connected to the immediate moment, and it has enough power to move us, to protect another being, to protect ourselves, to protect to uh, shift, to change, to do something, uh, an appropriate response in the moment. And what I did when I came into the practice was because I had this misunderstanding of what that anger was, I began to chip away at that energy and try to push it down, manage it, so I don't have any of that anger. And I'm just going to be equiposed. But that is more like what I would call apathy. Or uh, it's, it's like we have smoothed over the realness of life. And we've turned it into uh, turning away, turning away, turning away. And a hidden kind of avoidance. So when I went to Rodney, because life shook me to the point where I could not ignore and smooth over, I couldn't be apathetic or uh, uh, in denial and avoidance around the anger. That's what got me to the doorway of the possibility to awaken around anger is because I couldn't fake it anymore. Uh, it's, it's probably the best way to say it. I couldn't fake being not angry anymore. And the anger itself was spilling out all over my life. So I started uh, practicing and there's three things I wanna tell you that I kind of learned from all of this practice I was doing. One is this anger I'm going to talk about is what I would call fake anger. It's false anger. It's not real anger. Real anger is ephemeral. It's connected to an emotion, an event, a moment in time. It comes and goes. But this fake anger that we've learned to live with is connected to the underlying tendencies of greed, hatred, and delusion. It's, connect, it's connected to uh, getting what we want, getting rid of what we don't want, and uh, ignoring the 
the edges of life. It's also um, expansive. It is a, uh, it's subtle, but it expands. So it starts from a moment in time. Some thing could even be starts from real anger, but it starts from this moment in time. We don't see that moment in time. And it begins to subtly expand and expand and expand and expand. And that's what I was noticing I could not control was the expansion of what was actually just regular uh, irritation. If we don't pay attention to that spark and that subtle expansion, that subtle expansion consumes us. And that's when our, the torment of our mind just loses its capacity. The second thing is this anger that I'm talking about that we talk about in Dhamma. I'm trying to think of another word to call it, but fake anger is the best I can do. This fake anger is a trickster of mind. For those of us that like or feel comfortable being angry, then this trickster energy can show up in a way that we don't have to feel all the other emotions we don't want to feel. Like I do not like the felt sense of disappointment. And I do not like feeling hurt, but I can feel anger anytime. I'm good with that. So it's a trickster. It convinces us that what we are is angry. So we don't have to feel disappointed and we don't have to feel hurt or sad. On the other hand, for people who are afraid of anger, it's a trickster. It tells you, oh, you're sad. You're not angry. There's no anger here. This is sadness. Oh, yeah, no, this is not anger. This is hurt. This is loneliness. But really, on the inside, you're seething with anger that you're not dealing with. And so that trickster energy of this fake uh, anger, we got to begin to come to a practice relationship with it. And the last thing is, is that it is, um, um, it knows you can't con it. You can't con the, the false anger, the fake anger or manipulate it. It knows you better than you know yourself. So even when I try to pretend like I was working with it. I wasn't really working with it. It was working with me. And it wasn't until I went to Rodney and I actually decided to take it on that I started working with this difficulty. So anger, real anger, uh, is connected to an event. It's like an emotional thing. It's a, it's part of our humanness. We get emotional around experience. We have sensations, we have the sense doors, we have consciousness, we have emotions that show up around experience. But this fake false anger isn't connected to any kind of person or event. So we just generate the anger from our own judgments about it. Um, it's really more like a facade. It is greed, hatred, and delusion masquerading as something wholesome. And it's connected to wanting our way or not wanting what is. Somehow not wanting to deal with something. This is the fake anger I'm talking about. It's not the real anger because the real anger, we can practice with it like we practice with any emotion. 
We can just notice it, notice the sensation of it, noticing the change in nature of it, and begin to see, oh, there are images, there are sensations, and then there are thoughts. And we can, we can separate them into parts, and that anger itself is not going to eat us alive. The anger I'm talking about is the anger that spins in our mind continuously, that it spins all night and it spins tomorrow and I can't seem to get away from it. And finally I let it go. And then somebody walks up to you and says, what happened to you the other night? You look so upset. Oh my God, there it is again. And then you're back in it, spinning, 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 spinning. That's the kind of anger I'm talking about. The anger that hates all people in that group, the people that 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 has such a judgment that that is wrong and this is right, and there's no in between space. That kind of anger, the kind of anger that you uh, feel it in your body so intensely you can't even. Um, you can't feel it because it's too painful in and of itself. It's just thick with thought, imagery, and uh, that looping mechanism that happens on news shows. I think we, I think that's really going to hurt us in the long run as people. This just an aside. All that constant looping that happens with uh, when you watch hurricane news or news in general and they loop and they loop and they loop i think it's sending a looping idea to the mind to loop and loop and loop and we get stuck in the same thing in our minds where it loops the same you hear the same words over and 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 it's a level of thinking that we can't just get rid of we're like trapped in it it is the nature of torment. And I think this is false or fake anger that uh, is really just um, greed, hatred, and delusion masquerading as anger. And when we practice with it as greed, hatred, and delusion, we can unhook ourselves from it. But if we try to fix the reason why we think we're angry, then it doesn't work like real anger. All right, so this facade is usually basically um, having us not deal with what's really going on, some other general emotion, or most, mostly it is a wanting something we cannot have and refusing to accept that having something we do not want and we refuse to accept that or we are trapped in a distortion of mind one of those thinking something's impermanent and thinking something's permanent and it's not it's impermanent thinking something's going to satisfy us and it doesn't taking something personal that's not personal or expecting the world to be lovely and it's not we get caught in one of those four distortions and we're, 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 we're off to the races. We don't look at the greed, hatred, and delusion. We stick with the thing outside of us, blaming, complaining, arguing, trying to fix that outer world to make it work. And we don't see that this anger is masquerading, is, uh, this is greed, hatred, and delusion, masquerading as anger, the self-righteous anger, and we instead just get swallowed up by it. So I did come up with a way to work with it though. I did come up with a way that I could um, be with it. And this is what I consider, I, I gave it an acronym. There's TAME, you know, like taming of the shrewd. I'm taming this anger, this false masquerading stuff. It's like when you have a puppy and you bring it home and it's all over the place and you gotta manage it down to learning how to pee on the paper, 
there's no taming really cats. I mean, they kind of just do their thing. You could try to tame them, but that doesn't really work. But with dogs, you can kind of tame them. Even with children, it's we don't think of it as taming them. But if children, I, I, I remember seeing a commercial one time. I don't know if you guys remember. I don't even remember who did this commercial, but it was the most profound set of commercials I ever seen. There was a series of them. It was about climate change, I think, but I'm not quite sure who did it. I don't know if it was a, a nonprofit or, or a for-profit organization, but what it had was the world without any adults. And it was the world with just kids in it. So you'd have these kids where somebody would give them, they'd have the car and they're standing at the car, like with the keys wondering, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, and they had these kids in front of giant machines and, you know, and not knowing how to deal with the world and not knowing what to do with the world that what that seemingly the adults had left behind. So um, in a way, we are like training our kids uh, to be able to live in the world uh, without the unruliness. Um, that was one, that's what made me think of that commercial because one of the commercials had the kids with all this uh, food at the grocery store and they were just eating all the candy in the candy aisle, just sitting there eating all the candy. And that's where they were gonna sit and eat and eat and eat. <laughs> they weren't going anywhere else. So. Let me just tell you what these four, it's four areas, four ways. And I took this in relation to, uh, the Buddha gave uh, five ways to deal with stealing the um, um, obsessive thinking. And this is sort of along that same line of, of uh, how to steal obsessive thinking. It's along the same line. But the first thing you have to do is to begin to translate because translating, we, we have to translate what we see into our lives as practitioners. So not everything that we're looking at is as we see it. And sometimes we have to translate it so that we kind of understand. And the, what I'm really pointing to the translating is moments of irritation. We have to start translating that as greed, hatred, and delusion. Meaning that we have to begin to see that these frustrations and these irritations, that we have the learned behavior to just suck it up. Just, okay, just don't say nothing. Okay, I'm just gonna wait till this passes. I'm just not gonna say anything. When people irritate us and we're just like, oh, I'm not gonna say anything. It's just, that's just it. And we just hold it in and then we don't think nothing of it. It is a habit. We do it without even thinking, but it expands into anger and rage. So learning to translate our, um, learning to translate our experiences into greed, hatred, and delusion. The reason why we translate it into greed, hatred, and delusion is because if you think of an irritation as greed, wanting something that's not offered, or hatred, not wanting something that is offered, or delusion, then the only way for you to practice with that as a practitioner is to let go of the greed, hatred, or delusion. We understand that as practitioners. We understand that we need to let go of the wanting and the not wanting a, a long-term practice that's what we are in the world to do but if we do not translate the moment that that irritation is coming up as this is greed hatred and delusion don't get it twisted then the twixter the trickster uh fake anger masquerading as wisdom will convince us that that thing outside of us is the problem. You're the problem. That's the reason. If you just would do it the right way, then I won't be angry. 
And we'll even try to learn how to say it nicely. Do nonviolent communication and all kinds of little communication tools to help me say it nicely. You still have to do it my way. But if we learn to translate all these irritants as greed, hatred, and delusion, then we will turn that lens inward and begin to unhook ourselves from some of this uh, fuel that fuels this rage that comes from it. Um, we also learn how to be with unpleasantness and that strengthens our ability later on when you start seeing, you, you, you're just gonna see your anger really. The second A is you avert, it's like averting your attention. It's not avoiding, it's averting your attention because some energy is, um, you're not ready to deal with it right now. You see it, but you're not ready to deal with it. So the, the point of averting is to make sure you acknowledge, oh, I see you, this greed, hatred, and delusion. I see that. Oh, I see what you're trying to do. But I can't, I just don't have the capacity to deal with this right now. And it's giving yourself permission to acknowledge it and not do anything about it. But in the acknowledging, you disrupt that masquerading, expansive, uh, ex that ex uh expandability that happens when we just don't even see it when we avoid it and don't see it then it can expand so this is more of learning how to give yourself permission to say not right now i see you i got you i know i see this greed I can see the wanting, yes, yes. I see the don't wanting, I got that, yes, yes. But in this case, I'm just gonna have to get what I can get and move on. I can see it. Then there's the uh, M, and the M is more like maneuvering. So maneuvering is sometimes, I've watched myself, yell at people. I've watched myself build up in anger, snap at someone like my son or my sister, and I'm arguing with them, I'm yelling, I'm seeing them. I can't necessarily interrupt it, but I see what's happening. And later, I can begin to kind of think back over that moment and See, oh, I see. I see what I did there. It's like you're maneuvering through the anger, like the uh, the um, uh, the minefield, uh, without um, really doing anything about the mines. You're just maneuvering through it in a general way. You're learning to be intimate with this anger but you're not putting any requirement right now to kind of fix it. Let me just, let me just, you gotta see yourself yelling at someone without interrupting it. You gotta see what the pain of that is to the person you're yelling at, to the, per you don't even, some people may not yell, I'm the yelling type, but some of y'all might be more like, you just give them the cold shoulder, you just don't talk to them, or you're all nice, but really you're saying some pretty cutting, some pretty, you know, sarcastic things. You gotta see what is actually going on there. And that's the kind of maneuvering through. You don't quickly change your way so you don't see it. You actually see it and feel it. And the last one is more of the uh, exploration. So you don't, um, you don't, um, this is more uh, what you're building up to, I think. You're building up to a point where you're actually with your rage, with your anger, and you are letting your full body feel it. You're letting your whole system understand what are the words that you are actually saying. And you don't have to 
This can be after you've done some, gotten mad about something and, uh, or something that keeps spinning in your mind over and over and over and you can't let it go. Then sit down on the cushion and uh, what are you saying exactly? What is this? List, look at that picture again in the mind and feel into the body what the sensations are and see where that distortion is. Where is it? What's the greed here that I'm trying to get that's not offered or the aversion that I'm trying to get rid of and it's offered? This is it. This is what was offered. Somebody said something like, you're stupid. Okay. Embarrassed me in front of everybody. But it was already said. So you're spinning around. How could they say that? Doesn't make any sense. They already said it. It's done. So why do you keep holding on to it? What else is going on there? What are you trying to write that you can't in your mind? You can't write the wrong or you're trying to see the truth of that distortion and that delusion that's in the mind, um, the aversion or the greed or, or the distortion, you know, not wanting to accept something like uh, the world is not lovely. So that's that's my I find I'm always telling myself the world is not lovely to her. Yes, people talk like that. Yes, they said that. I I have learned to just say to myself, mm, yes, they didn't have they have different upbringing than I have. I come from a different kind of mama than they have. It's that kind of energy because I cannot believe sometimes the things that people say. But at the same time, it's already said. And either I stay wrapped in their energy or I find a way to unhook myself from their energy and remain connected to my own energy. Otherwise, I'm spinning in their energy and they don't care that they have that energy. I do. So I got to unhook myself from theirs. Anyway, you want to spend some time in this exploration as in, a, in, a, in an observing way, not spinning in the story so much as understanding what are the building blocks that are making this up? What is it that's pulling on you so? So what's the distortion that you're stuck in? And begin to see where the clinging is that you can let go of. You gotta find that clinging. And once you realize I'm clinging to this, but I cannot get this. This is what I want, but I cannot get this. And then you can let go of that. And, and, and the whole facade of the anger, this false anger goes away. I really think that we are doing something remarkable in this inside practice. It is remarkable. And I don't know how to say it. I wish I could get on a mountaintop and yell it and scream it, that we are doing something remarkable because most of the Sangha Sanghas were monastic and they're, they were, the, the deep practitioners were the monastics and the monastics carried the practice. And here we are carrying this practice. But if we're gonna carry this practice, then like the monastics, we have to uproot greed, hatred, and delusion. That's our task. It's not just to get together and feel good. It's to get together and help each other uproot greed, hatred, and delusion. But we are lay practitioners doing this. So if we're lay practitioners here in a Dhamma talk like this, uprooting greed, hatred, and delusion, working on awakening, oh my God, you take that and you put that out in the world, I think you are going to make a major, major, major impact on the world. It may not seem like it, but because we're living in the dark ages, so it seems like, you know, it's all going to be dark all the time. But there is a renaissance after the dark ages. It does come. Kitasaro one time, I'll say this and then I'll end, I'll end with a poem. Kitasaro one time, you know, we were talking, he, did, he came to one of the teacher training things and 
he made some, we used to give some dumb talk and then he, 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 at the end of the talk, we had a break and I went up to him to ask him, you know, what, what did you mean by this? No, he made in a passing comment, you know, living in a Buddha Indian era, Buddha Indian era. I heard that. So after the, after he finished talking, we were on a break. I go up to him and I'm like, get a sorrow. What do you mean? Buddha Indian era. What are you talking about? He says, oh yeah, that's what we're living in. We're living in a Buddha Indian era. I need a moment here because I don't think of me living in a Buddha Indian era. I'm like, what does that mean? He says, the Buddha's teachings are ending. And I said, well, what does, what can we do? How do we prevent that? And he says, you can't prevent the Buddha's teaching from ending, but you can extend how long they last. And we as practitioners are extending the Buddha's wisdom beyond where it was. And so as long as we as practitioners practice, we are extending his talk. Do you get that? We are extending his wisdom, extending his wisdom. So we don't want to just extend his wisdom around samadhi. That's good. Yes. We want to extend his wisdom around the destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion. Because as long as greed, hatred, and delusion live in this world, we are going to deal with racism homelessness, we're going to live with poverty, and we're going to live with climate change and all the stuff that we hate so much, we're going to live with it. We're going to live with the violence and the anger and the rage and all of it. Because it's connected to greed, hatred and delusion, and not the Republicans, or those people. It's not connected to that. It's just the nature of greed, hatred and delusion. And we all have it. So just imagine as practitioners, the possibility of what we could do if we begin to truly uproot ourselves from greed, hatred, and delusion. I gotta tell you, I think it's gonna be a whole, it's a game changer. I think it's gonna be a whole nother world that we're living in. So I gotta, I got a poem that I want to read. It's called The Mosquito Among the Raindrops by a person named Teddy Macker. So this is what Teddy says. A mosquito among the raindrops. It's equivalent to getting hit, said the scientist, by a falling school bus and hit every 20 seconds. And the mosquito lives. In fact, she doesn't even try to avoid the drops. No zigzagging, no ducking, no hiding under eaves. How does she do it? No resistance to the force. She hitches a ride on the blow, a stowaway on that which brings her down. She becomes one with the drop, knowing that to fly again, she must fall. That's what we're asked to do. We're asked to hitch a ride on our irritations, our frustrations, our little things we don't like. Hitch a ride on that and not resist it and begin to uncover the truth of what is behind it. So let's uh, let's sit quietly here for a second and thank you so much for your time and attention. We'll let these words kind of toss themselves around. Great. Thank you so much. I kind of lost in my words here, but there's still a little time for some questions or comments if people want to share some comment or 
question you have. Um, this is Linda. I, <clears throat> Linda, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really, really, really loved your talk. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you, Linda. Anybody have any anger issues to work on? Is it just me? <laughs> not just you. It's not just you. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think it's just me. You know, something that uh, Greg Kramer one time told me, I asked him, um, <laughs> who said, Jim said, how much time you got? Yeah, that's right. That's more of my world. Uh, Greg Kramer one time, I, I was going to give this talk on the Sangha, and I said, uh, you know, Greg, what do, you know, Greg Kramer is the one that came up with uh, uh, Inside Dialogue. This is a relational practice. I see you, Catherine, just one second. And so I said, uh, <laughs> I said, Greg, what's the point of Sangha? I mean, what can I say to people? How do I convince people that Sangha, it really is the, um, the whole of the practice? And uh, Greg said, Tuere, how would you know you were arrogant unless somebody else told you? And I thought about it. I'm like, uh, I wouldn't. Who's going to think they're ang arrogant? We think we're just good. And then somebody <laughs> has to tell you, yeah, you're arrogant. You might want to tone that down a bit. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Hi. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Such great, great teaching and great wisdom. Um, I wanted to ask you if you can give us some way to really distinguish between the fake anger and the real anger i guess it's a feeling but i don't know if you're in your I experience think how did you learn to do that real anger doesn't spin it's an emotion it doesn't spin it comes and goes meaning that it's 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 it, part of the reason why we're stuck in so much fake anger is because we have access to so much social injustice and pain, but there's no way to do anything about it. We just know that it exists. So we get angry about things that happen. That is not real anger. Mm -hmm. That anger is just floating in the air because really what I think it is, is that we don't want what's happening to be happening and it's more of the hatred or the delusion. And so we're stuck in anger, but that anger cannot move because it's it doesn't have any, it's not connected to any event. It's just a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so what you wanna work with is assume it's all fake. That's <laughs> the way I worked with it. I assumed all my anger is pretty much fake. And when I assumed it was fake, the anger that was real, um, it does not stay. It does not, it, uh, it, it, it gives you the power to do something and you actually move and do something. You speak up and say something. You do something in that moment. But 90% of our anger is fake because there's nothing to be done. We're just spinning in something I don't like and wish it wasn't, and it is. You said the word power, and that kind of, that helps me because it's, I, I, I do recognize in myself that sort of kind of, kind of equal opportunity frustration has behind it a sense of just powerlessness. Like, I don't really want to do anything to change anything. I'm just, I'm angry yes that's it that's the fake anger and, and that's what's killing us so what it is that you're wanting is really you're wanting the world to be lovely and it's not so you want to believe that the world's going to be okay but it's not or you're stuck in a situation where you're you're angry that um 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 oh, what's the other one that oh this is a not wanting something to be so it's hatred i don't want this to be like this but it is 
And so at some point we have to make peace with the truth that this is the world we live in. All right, this is the world we live in. Now, how am I gonna live in a world that manages, that li- that exists in this fashion? But we keep trying to live in the other world that is not here right. and we can't. And that's where all that anger is coming from and it's killing us. But I think if we all lived in this world, then we could actually move hearts and minds together and make something happen. That's what I think happened with George Floyd. That's why it was so shocking is because everybody was like right here with that. And then it begins to dissipate, but because there's just so much stuff going on. So I just think if we learn to just be right here, our practice is designed to handle the truth of this very life. It's not necessary to smooth it all out so we can deal with it. That overwhelm is mind. And so we have to learn how to be with the world as it is. And that means we have to begin to see when we are spinning in that fake anger to keep from just feeling the pain. But that pain is gonna, it's ephemeral. It it comes and goes. I thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. You didn't know Amy? Uh-huh. Thank I you. I know Amy. Thank you, Tori. This is beautiful. And I like how you intertwined the fake anger with the real anger and brought in all the isms that do exist in the world. Um, And they're always going to be there until you're right, until we tell our hate, greed, and delusion no longer exists. Yep. Um, And so I understand the the difference between fake and the the real anger when someone hits you or you know verbally or, or emotionally or whatever i'm wondering though i guess if you're bombarded with events and that constant how do you deal with that constant let the racism or ableism or homophobia that is ever present and i i don't know maybe maybe we're not hit that often but we think we're hit more than we are Yes, I know what you're saying. It is still the same though, because what I found was that a lot of the racism and the anger I experienced from it, I was trapped in someone else's energy. Mm -hmm. They do some racist thing and they don't really care. They go on about their business and I am stuck spinning in this rage. I remember I was at a retreat and I was teaching and another woman was teaching. She was young white woman and this whole big old thing happened and it was ugly. It's too long of a story for me to go into the details, but it was ugly. Yeah. And every time somebody would look at me and say, just to help you get a sense of it, she started crying. And so every time somebody would come to me and say, why was so and so crying? Oh my God, that would just start me right up and I'd be all this anger and I'm the angry black woman, she's the poor white woman and I'm stuck in it, right? All the time. I go home, I can't let it go. I talk to my friends, I can't let it go. Now she has gone on about her life and that event happened a week and a half ago and I'm still spinning in the rage. Yeah. Racism or not racism, whether that was racism or not is irrelevant in the moment. 
that I'm a week and a half out and I can't let it go. I have to learn how to let it go as my own practitioner. Mm -hmm. And Buddha was clear. The only reason why we suffer is because of clinging. So whatever that event was, racism or not, yeah. if I'm still holding it a week and a half later, I'm clinging to something. Yeah. And it turns out that's what I was clinging to. I was clinging to expecting the world to be better than that. I expected her to have more wisdom, to know what to do, to have more competency. I had all these expectations. And the truth is, she didn't have it. it it did I feel clinging to that anger? Yes, you are. You're. I'm clinging to the uh, uh, resistance that I wish it wasn't like that. Yeah. But when I let go of the clinging, what actually happened was we did a debrief call, and on that debrief call, now I don't have the anger anymore. Yeah. I mean, I don't have the the clinging anymore. I still have the anger. But I don't have the clinging. I got real anger, which is we cannot. Yeah, I'm not going to. Th this can't go on like this. Right. So I wanted to have a debrief and I insisted that we get a facilitator in to talk about what happened because yeah. you can't have that happen on a retreat in a teaching team. And that's what happened. We had a big debrief. It was really, really good. Yeah. But none of that would have been able to happen if I was still stuck in the rage every time I thought about it. Because all that would have happened is I would have been rageful and she would have been rageful and she would have started crying more and just would have been ugly. Nothing would have happened. I don't know whether she learned anything or not, but I know the team did, the teaching team did, and and uh, um, uh, what you call it? Um, the Lama, uh, Lama Rod was the one that did the facilitation. So it was really good. Yeah. And you learned. Thank you very much. You're it's, welcome. It's great to have people, especially women of color. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Nicole. Hi. Um, thanks so much for this talk. I appreciate it. Um, I think the place that I get stuck a little bit is uh -huh. I grew up in a house with tons of rage too. And my way of dealing with it was to repress things. So it's taken me much of my life to allow myself to be angry. Mm -hmm. And I'm always afraid that it, it's hard for me to even ex say the question, but you know, I get to that point where maybe I recognize, okay, yeah, I'm, um, I want things to be other than they are, but I don't want to, I, I don't know, I don't know how that turns into, I don't want to have to like, ah, I just, just how do you make that little switch? Okay, so let me ask you something. Yeah. What unpleasant energy will you go to? What do you mean? Sorry, I don't know what you mean. So, so I go to anger when I don't want to feel anything else because anger is okay for me so what unpleasant emotion is okay for you to feel is it sad sadness yeah okay that sadness is fake is not real that's what's fake it's fake anger it masquerades as sadness but it's not really sadness it's anger but, but i mean i do feel anger now but yeah. i don't know I don't want to have to push it down, but I don't get. I okay, don't really get I'm saying I'm saying you have to change the language a little bit here. Mm -hmm. You don't need to see the anger as being fake. You need to see your sadness is fake. That sadness is masquerading as righteousness, but really, it's just that's where your greed hatred and delusion falls so you will slide into the sadness and stay in the sadness rather than dealing with whatever the delusion or the aversion or the greed that you're you're uh, ignoring do you see what i'm saying i slide into anger but that's why i mean the anger is false it's not real anger for me 
I use anger instead of feeling sadness. And I really just need to feel the sadness. You use sadness instead of feeling anger. Even though you feel the anger, you don't, you still have more difficulty feeling the anger itself. And so instead, you feel a lot more sadness. So what I'm proposing is, is if you begin to question, I know this is gonna sound out there, but if you question that sadness as to whether or not that sadness is real or whether you're just using the sadness to not come to terms with what you're clinging to, what you wish were it, what was offered, but it's not, or what you don't want and you have it, or there's some delusion. If you use that sadness as a way to help you look at your greed, hatred, and delusion, you can unhook yourself from the clinging, just like I have to look at my anger. But sa that sadness to me is your anger turned inward. Do you see the difference? So it's sadness, but really it's anger that you don't really want to get to. I can do the sadness, but I can't do the anger. And I can get to some of the anger. That anger that you can get to is probably, if you can get to it and it let it go, then that's probably real anger. But if the sadness follows you day after day after day after day, then that sadness, that's the fake. I know I hate to say it. I mean, teach dumb teachers no, no, are not I supposed to tell somebody their sadness is fake. But let me say it a little bit better. <laughs> You're not supposed no, to say that's fake. fake. <laughs> oh, oh, <something>. <laughs> no, I see. What else did you want to say? I, I I get what you're saying. I mean, I it's that I don't I don't seem to get to the breakthrough point with sadness or anger. Yeah, I, I get to the point of understanding what I'm, you know, that the greed, aversion, or, um, you know, or just dis distortion, delusion, but I don't get beyond that. Like, so do you ever get to the place where you see what you're clinging to? Yes. And you can't let that clinging go? That's the problem. Ah, oh, can't let it go, huh? In many instances, yeah, that's. Actually, that could be could with good wisdom. Think of it more like this, right? If you see the clinging and you can't let it go, do you see the suffering it's causing? Don't try to let it go. Just look for the suffering that it's causing because suffering is the doorway into awakening. And uh, being aware of the suffering. So it's, that's what, that's the first noble truth. There is suffering here. So if you don't see the suffering, then of course you can't let that clinging go. But if you see the pain that's coming from that clinging, then letting go of the clinging will not be a problem at all. But you got to see not the suffering that's coming from the story, the suffering that's coming from your inability to let go of that which you're clinging to. Like if someone dies, that's when you really notice it. Someone dies, you can't let go of them and you're clinging to them, right? So just stay with that until you see the suffering. And as you see the suffering, like when my mom died, eventually I saw, oh yeah, I see. This is just not gonna, she's not coming back. That's just it. And I had to let her go, but it took a while for that to happen. But. I did not let go of the fact that I was clinging to mama being here. You see, so, so just keep the clinging there until you see the suffering. And I think the suffering will help you let go. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Suffering to the clinging, not suffering because of this story. It's not the suffering that mama died. It's the suffering that I will not let her go. That is what releases clinging. Thank you. All right, good. All right, good peoples. Our time has come to an end. Thank you for staying a little bit over. Until we meet again, thank you so much. You were wonderful. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. I love it. Thank you. 
I love it too. Believe always me, I nice, love it. Always nice. Always nice to have you, too, Ari. Thank you. Thank Nancy. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. Good night, everyone. All right. Bye bye. Bye. One bye. Love. Thank you so much, Thank you too, Yes, you're welcome. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye.